announcement. If you're going to watch this movie, and I actually think you should, it was hard to do a face for the poster frame for this review because I think the first half of the movie is unwatchable, but the second half, absolutely brilliant. But if you watch it, watch it in a dark room at night because once again, it has ridiculously poorly lit cinematography. And I watched it, I wasn't feeling well still on Monday, so I got my screener and I was like, this is great, I'll watch this. And I watched it in the middle of the afternoon, and let's just say, I couldn't see a lot of the movie, which was very frustrating. I might even watch it again. I know, right? I might even watch it again. Uh, so I have seen the Disney classic Peter Pan countless times, so many times, that I've kind of turned on it. I think it definitely needs to be updated. There's too much antiquated stuff in the 1953 original, as good as other elements are. Still my favorite ride in any Disney park. Uh, but since the story is in the public domain, I've also seen all the other versions that Hollywood and, uh, and beyond other formats have come up with. And with so many versions of Peter Pan, of course, we've seen it approached in many, many different ways at this point. Are there any new perspectives left? I can't believe it, but the answer is yes. And David Lowry has found it. He found a brilliant one that has totally made me re re uh, rethink what everything I thought I knew about Peter Pan. Uh, he's telling a story, a true story of children versus adults where the real enemy is time, right? All this is getting good. I wish that there were better producers because I wish someone had said to David Lowry, you have an amazing about 50 minutes here. The first 40, horrible. We gotta fix it so the people watch the last 50 minutes. You know, there's no shame in telling your director, especially when they're making a movie called Peter Pan and Wendy, that it has to have some commercial appeal. I know some of you will be like, oh, you wound me, Grace. But, I mean, let's just see how this movie does. Uh, you know, it's, no one can appreciate your brilliance if they don't see it. It's like if a tree falls in the woods kind of a thing. Uh, so anyway, the real enemy is time. Or is it? It's inevitable. So maybe make your peace with it. That's kind of what I think this movie is about. Children here see adults as the horrible fate that awaits them, while adults see children as a reminder of what they have lost. Oh, it's like I'm reading a brilliant paper on Peter Pan. So... As I said, too bad it takes half the movie for this perspective to kick in, with the first half being, as I said, unwatchable. When I was still watching the first half of this movie, I wasn't even sure I was going to review it. I was just going to tweet, don't watch it. But then it really turned things around. I'm glad I didn't turn it off. I paused it a couple of times because I was having such a difficult time getting through it, which is, again, one of the downfalls of streaming a movie. Uh, put your phone away from you because you might never get back into it. Just like lock your phone away and be like, I'm doing this. So forget a wedding cake style adaptation, which I think we all know is the most successful approach for Disney live action adaptations. This is a bread and water adaptation, crust of bread, cup of water, with hardly any magic or vibrant colors to be seen, which of course is what the original that everybody is, you know, rem remembers so fondly, you know, the Disney original, and what Disney itself is known for. So, you know, that's what people want from Disney. You know, this is like mostly medicine, very little sugar sprinkled on here. Uh, Neverland, it doesn't even look like a magical fantasy land at all. Or even an island. I'm like, I can tell you're at a shooting location, and that's what it feels like. Although it's later revealed that that's intentional. That it's supposed to look like the real world. Although I couldn't, that's one of the things I still couldn't quite figure out why. I was like, why? Maybe because it's an endless backyard, right? Or woods behind a house, right? It's, it's supposed to create that feeling. As a city child, I never played in the woods, and I'm not, I don't care for them. So I prefer the tropical paradise of the 1953 original film. Uh, at, so as for the first 40 minutes or so, uh, it's really a, a live action adaptation that's checking boxes, hitting the famous story points barely. Nana, right? There, there she is for just a moment. Father, oh, bye, nice seeing you for a second. Like Alan Tudyk, why did you waste his time? Uh, and while there were, the, we did see the rooftops of London and Big Ben, although I saw very little of them because I was watching this again during the day. I was like, what's happening? But they were there for just a few moments. But I thought, especially after I saw the whole movie, it was actually quite clever to have them go through Big Ben, to go through a clock, to either freeze or destroy time. I was like, oh, that's actually a hint of what's to come. Brilliant. As well as what I thought was an amazing opening line 
I just couldn't believe it. And that's why I was so surprised it got so bad for a while. But they had an opening line where it says, uh, you know, that Michael and John are playing. And John says, your time has run out, Peter Pan. And then uh, Michael sh shoots back, Peter Pan doesn't care about time. I was like, oh my God, goodness. Particularly because Peter Pan clearly does care, or even more so fear time, perhaps the most of all. Look what he's done to himself. Look what he's done to himself, which is great. Fantastic. Now, while I applaud the out-of-the-box thinking with the cast here, uh, and for instance, England's growing Middle Eastern population, which has been growing for quite some time, it's, it's pretty much, you know, a big part of the UK at this point. So I thought cal casting Alexander Maloney as, our, as the Peter Pan here was a really interesting idea. But here's the problem. He can't act. Uh, he's a horrible actor. I feel bad. He's a child actor, but he's pretty big. Um, he cannot act. I would say almost none of the children in this movie can act. And there are some great child actors out there. I wish the casting department had made that one of their priorities as well. The, the acting is truly awful, particularly in the first half of the movie. And so you combine that with David Lowry having very little interest in setting up his story, uh, it's just brutal to sit through. In fact, I would even say if you can't do it, fast forward to the end of the Skull Rock sequence, which is also awful, where the crocodile shows up. And then right after that, and even kind of there, things start to get really interesting. Let me tell you this. I have watched Peter Pan so many different times and so many different, you know, uh, tellings of it, but it has never occurred to me until this version that the crocodile who swallowed the ticking clock chasing Captain Hook is mortality. Wow, oh, this is amazing. And that's why Hook fears it so. This is so amazing. Like I said, it's like a great, brilliant paper on Peter Pan. This is like realizing that Mary Poppins is actually about Mr. Banks, something I didn't realize until I watched Saving Mr. Banks, a movie also from Disney that's good from beginning to end, and that showcased what the Mary Poppins story was actually about. And as I said, maybe better understand why my dad loved that movie so much, because he was going through a tough time, and he was, uh, you know, relating to Mr. Banks. I was just like, I can't hear Feed the Birds one more time, man. You're driving me crazy. But after I saw that movie, I called my dad up and said, Dad, were you having a hard time? And he said, yes, I was. And it was just incredible. And, and so I feel like a kinship with this movie as well, because it's just opening up a whole world to me of something like a, a new part of the story. Now, at first, I couldn't understand during the first 40 minutes why Jude Law signed on for this movie. But once we got past that truly awful Skull Rock sequence, also bad, uh, the movie started to come alive as David Lowery suddenly had interest in it and began to unravel the story of Peter Pan, highlighting themes that have always been there, like the crocodile, and also making bold changes to the story, which I actually really like. I'm not going to spoil them here. I want you to discover them. They're cl really clever. Uh, Law's Hook has a number of brilliant, absolutely heartbreaking lines. I laughed out loud. I was blown away. I was like, I cannot believe how good these lines are. Uh, and he's talking about growing up and the differences between adults and children. That pirate ship be firing truth bombs. And it's hitting its target. It is connecting. And by the end of the movie, I was absolutely moved to tears, both by the ending between Peter Pan and Captain Hook. I was like, I can't believe it. I'd kind of like a sequel. And Tinkerbell's final line. Oh, that was so beautiful. And also, Wendy has a moment in the third act where I was just blown away by the artistry and emotion of what I was seeing. I, was, I, didn't, I never expected it. It fit perfectly with the story. It was brilliant. Speaking of Wendy, I recently, uh, I rewatched the 1953 movie. I didn't get to the end. I liked the setup at the beginning still, but then I was like, there's a lot of bad stuff here. I couldn't watch it anymore. It's similar to Cinderella, where I'm like, she's lost her mind talking to these birds and mice. But I didn't care in the 1953 Peter Pan for how all the female characters, Wendy, Tinkerbell, Tiger Lily, the mermaids, were all fighting each other viciously over Peter Pan. Like they tried to murder each other. So I was delighted to see the female characters here working together, acknowledging and supporting one another. Oh, it was great, because it seems that Neverland can be a man's world too. Oh, stop it. These are important lessons, and I think stuff we're still, still dealing with today, and it was great. Uh, again, Maloney, though, is not a great actor. There are plenty of great child actors, so it's a real shame. But the movie isn't really about Peter Pan. He kind of takes a back seat. Peter Pan is more of an idea in this movie, an ideal for Wendy that she finds out maybe isn't as grand as she thought, and something that haunts Captain Hook. 
Lowry's movie is really about Wendy and Captain Hook, and Jude Law does a great job, obviously, and Ever Anderson, daughter of Mila Jovovich and Paul W.S. Anderson, seems wooden in the first half, but once she starts getting better lines in the second half and some action sequences where she does her mother proud, she does a real nice job. I thought she was very, very good. Also, I gotta say, as a woman, I appreciated the girl power elements subtly added here. Sometimes, in a few instances, not so subtle. I was like, you gotta balance this action scene a little bit better. But, and then also to see them supporting each other, I was like, this is fantastic. And it's a particularly good movie for little girls. It's also a good movie for all adults, because again, of that commentary on growing up. Uh, the, and maybe somebody who's about to grow up. Maybe it's, a, I don't know, it's a very sad movie. It's a little bit of a downer. I'll talk about that towards the end of the review. But the, again, the first half is just so horrible, but the second half is so brilliant, so profound, that if you're at all interested in storytelling and playing with stories, I love to play with stories, as you know. So I think it's definitely worth your time if you're like me in that regard. Again, I was blown away several times in the second half, and I will never look at the story of Peter Pan the same way again. I also thought the score by Daniel Hart was fantastic. It was playing over the end credits. I still had tears in my eyes, and I was like, oh, this was actually pretty good. I also thought the VFX were pretty good. For instance, Yara Shahidi is very convincingly a fairy flying around. Like in the classic story, this Tinkerbell doesn't talk, although here it's because Wendy, John, and Michael can't understand fairy. But while Shahidi looks beautiful, she's not a very physical actress, and she can't really do the pantomime that the character is famous for. But again, she does have that incredible line at the end that kind of made up for everything. I was like, it's so beautiful. Jim Gaffigan was also surprisingly moving as Smee, now reimagined as a father figure to Captain Hook. A lot of talk about mothers and fathers as well. And he though, wasn't funny at all, despite being played by comedian Jim Gaffigan. And I do miss the classic songs from the 1953 film. Those are still iconic. And there are a few pirate songs here, but unbelievably, not a pirate's life for me. I'm like, how are we not singing any of these songs? Ridiculous. This movie is a bit of a downer, as I said, and I don't agree with many of its points of view. Uh, never look back. Never. You will drown. I, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of that. I think that's important, and I think it's important to stay positive. But that doesn't mean I still can't appreciate what this movie is saying, and again, I think it has some brilliant observations. And I think really unpacks a layer of Peter Pan, like breaks through to a sub-layer that we didn't even know was there. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. First half of the movie, unwatchable. Second half of the movie, absolutely brilliant. So I wish someone had the guts to tell that to David Lowry, so maybe he could have fixed it. All right, so that's my review of Peter Pan and Wendy hitting Disney Plus this Friday, a, a service you can fast forward. So I at least hope you check out the second half. All right, share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.